Thank you, Kim. Sure, Justice. Susan Bakshian. I'm here. David Boyd. I'm present. Alex Chen. Thomas Duncan. Present. Jeremy Evans. Here. Jackie Gardina. Brian Harrison. Present. James Henderson. Here. Esther Lynn. Here. Tracy Montes. Here. Joshua Pertula. Natalie Rodriguez. Here. Christine Rossi. Here. Emily Skivoletto. Here. Karen Silverman. And Amy Williams. I see Alex Chench joining us. We have a quorum, Justice. Thank you very much. Welcome and good morning, everybody. On behalf of myself and the vice chair, Josh Portola, I wanted to welcome you to the third meeting of the Blue Ribbon Commission for the future of the California Bar. I hope you're all doing well and it's nice to see you. I know that by now everyone is familiar with the, the charter and the mission of our group, but for any members of the public, um, I'm just going to repeat that and state as following from our charter. The Blue Ribbon Commission is charged with developing recommendations concerning whether and what changes to make to the California bar exam and whether to adopt alternative or additional testing or tools to ensure minimum competence to practice law. So there's a lot to unpack there. And today um, we will be hearing from one of the presenters that was previously scheduled for our last meeting in September, but unfortunately we ran a, a little bit over and the presenter uh, was graciously, has graciously agreed to join us here today. And so we're very thankful for their flexibility and time. In addition, today, the goal is really to provide an opportunity for all of us to engage in more of a free-flowing discussion rather than the presentation type of format that we've utilized in our prior meetings. The objective is really just to give all members an opportunity to tell us your thoughts and your perspectives on what types of recommendations this group should be making, ideally to the California Supreme Court and also the State Bar. We understand that many of your views at this time are preliminary and will be better informed by further thought, reflection, and additional information that we receive. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it, it will be helpful um, to take everyone's sort of temperature at this time and spark further dialogue as well. As always during this process, I encourage you to share your thoughts and perspectives, perspectives as you have been and to keep an open mind on others' views as well. Before we begin on the business portion of the agenda, we have an opportunity for public comment and I'm going to go over the uh, logistics and ground rules for that. Public comments during the meeting are limited and members of the public who wish to comment were encouraged to submit written comments prior to the meeting to ensure the commission would have time to consider those comments. And the commission has received written public comments so for two of them and we thank you for that. I'm going to, in a moment, ask the commission coordinator to call members of the public in the order that they appear if they wish to comment. And due uh, to time constraints, public comments are limited to two minutes. To facilitate hearing as many members of the public as possible, if 
this is applicable. Please do not repeat any points that were made from previous speakers. And we'll have a maximum of 15 minutes of total public comment. The logistics are as follows. For anyone participating via Zoom video, you should have a function that allows you to virtually raise your hand. It's a little hand icon and should appear at the bottom towards the center of your screen. If you do wish to make a public comment, please click on that. And for anyone who is participating by phone rather than video, you can also um, virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine, the star key and the number nine. And at this point, the coordinator will ask to call members of the public in the order that they have selected to speak. Um, at this moment, Justice, we have Mr. Benjamin Cohn. Go ahead, Thank Mr. You. Cohn. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I wanted to comment on sort of the vein of the importance of getting preliminary discourse of dialogue. I think that the public comment is for that purpose, but I also think that it's a little hard to speak to some of the details of the concerns without access to as much information as uh, the decisions would ideally be informed by. And currently, public records requests responses have been aggressively uh, limited in what records will be disclosed and how uh, the exemptions are interpreted, even where maybe there could be an exemption to interpret it a certain way, that even there should be a policy uh, filter too as to when the exemption will be asserted so that members of the public have the information to make more informed comments. Uh, beyond that, I, I just want to uh, highlight that I had submitted written comment and I would encourage you to look at the situation with COVID for the long term for the reasons discussed in there. I don't think this is going to be something that will go away by the time the commission's recommendations will be relevant. I think COVID could shape the safety of, and at least future pandemics should be considered too, uh, of the bar exam or the licensing system for applicants for years or even decades to come and should be considered in being resilient for that. So thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. At this moment, Justice, we don't have any other public comment. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Cohn, for your comments. We also have received your written comments as well. We will go ahead and move on to the business portion of our meeting. And we will begin with a report from the Oregon Alternatives to the Bar Task Force. Um, we'll uh, be joined by Joanna Perini Abbott, who is the chair of the Oregon State Bar Board of Examiners. As reflected in the materials that we've received, Oregon has, is proposing two alternative pathways which include an experiential pathway and a supervised practice pathway, rather than the existing, or in addition to the existing licensing examination for admission to the bar. We welcome Joanna. And let me see, I, I'm not sure where on my screen you're at, but I trust that you're with us. I am with you. There um, you are, okay, welcome, thank you. And uh, Dean Brian Gallini from Willamette Law School was also going to join me as a presenter. I don't know if he's made it on yet. We were slotted at 1020, and I know he had another meeting up until this point, but I'm happy to jump in um, and he will join so that we don't get you guys behind. Um, that would be great. Thank you. <coughs> um, I see him in the attendee pool, so maybe if you want to wait. Oh, oh, here, he's coming. Okay, perfect.
Okay, I see Dean Galini on. And so I will go ahead and jump into our presentation. Um, just a little background. Uh, I think we all remember the summer of 2020 as everything got thrown into flux. That was when I first met Dean Galini as I was then the vice chair of the Board of Bar Examiners for Oregon. And the Board of Bar Examiners and the law schools were working very closely to figure out how we were gonna put on a bar exam or get applicants licensed. Um, our state that summer did give emergency diploma privilege to certain law school graduates um, as a one-time thing, but they then um, asked us as the Board of Bar Examiners to convene a task force with stakeholders throughout the legal community. So lawyers um, from DOJ, lawyers from various d diverse affinity bars, the law schools, law students, the PLF, which is our um, state-run liability insurance fund, and to gather these people together to determine if Oregon should be considering alternatives to the bar exam more long-term than just the emergency diploma privilege that was granted in the summer of 2020. We convened and began our work in December. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, I don't think, there we go. Um, we sort of started our work with two key principles in mind. And they were one, if we were going to move away from a bar exam or offer alternatives to a bar exam, we needed to ensure that any alternative provided at least as um, at least the same level of consumer protection as the bar exam does. So really the board of bar examiners is tasked with one main goal, which is to ensure licensed attorneys are competent to practice law. And you know, for decades, we've used the bar exam to do that. So if we were gonna move away from that, how could we ensure that whatever alternatives we considered would um, reach up to at least that level? And um, doing that requires you to figure out what is what does Oregon consider competent to practice law? And um, so we had just recently in the past two or three years, <coughs> and I apologize, I'm, have a little cold, so thank God for Zoom meetings. Um, in the past two or three years, created essential eligibility requirements. So we saw those as the basis of um, what we thought was competent to practice law in Oregon. We also turned to the IELTS report on building a better bar, and I know you've all heard extensively from um, Deb Merritt at the last session, and um, in many ways, I feel like my presentations kind of just, we just piggybacked on the great work of all of the people you heard from before. Um, but we also considered the core competencies listed in the IELTS report uh, in considering what is competent to practice law and therefore what would our, our alternatives have to be measuring if they were going to be at least as um, rigorous as the bar exam in measuring attorney uh, competence. And we also looked at equity. Um, the goal of the, the bar exam shouldn't be to keep people out of the bar. That's not an appropriate tool for the bar exam. If the goal of the bar exam um, should be just to determine competence. And so if there were unnecessary barriers either created by the bar exam or by anything we were considering, um, we, we wanted to remove those and make sure what we were measuring really was just attorney competence and not creating uh, inequities to students of color or, or applicants who were first generation law students or applicants who had financial constraints around being able to study for the bar. Um, and I will now give Dean Galini a chance to speak on these two points if you'd like as well. Yeah, good morning, great to be with all of you. And uh, apologies for being a couple minutes behind. It's kind of hashtag Dean Life running from meeting to meeting and appreciate the chance to spend a few minutes with you. I think the additional organizing principle that I would add that, that's not on the slide, that's I think an important framing for us at least is, you know, we wanted to enter these conversations with an understanding or rather a better understanding of, you know, when someone says, 
these proposals lower the bar, there's oftentimes a, a, at its core a misunderstanding about, well, what do we mean when we say somebody passed the bar? And, and Oregon's a, a good example because, you know, stakeholders will view bar passage as either, you know, this binary framing you passed or you failed. Uh, but, you know, there's, of course, the first distinction between whether you're a UB jurisdiction or in, in the case of California or not. And then within UB jurisdictions, as, as we are in Oregon, there's the question of, you know, what, what cut score governs? And so, you know, in Oregon, for instance, we recently lowered the cut score from 274 to 270. So the point is that I might, as an examinee, pass with, or sorry, fail Oregon with a 269, but pass, quote unquote, in 19 other uh, states. So I could therefore port my score in a variety of other, uh, of other states and pass. But we found that entering these licensure conversations an overwhelming majority, until still to some degree, in reflecting and going through the public comment, we haven't got reached everyone, but interested stakeholders just didn't have that level of understanding around really what we mean by bar passage. And I, and I would just offer that as kind of this umbrella framework that then we might dive into the, the twin goals that, that Joe points out with consumer protection and equity. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, just a little background on what, we, what our process was. So like I said, we gathered a, just a very, our goal was to get as many stakeholders as possible to the table. Um, and we thought about it from all perspectives in terms of practicing lawyers. We had uh, representatives from the Supreme Court. We had representatives from our insurance, our state run insurance um, consumer protection agency from the DOJ. All of the law schools were represented at the administrative level and the student level. Um, and then uh, it was about two thirds practicing attorneys and then one third sort of this other makeup. Um, and we began by looking at what's being done now. What alternatives are there to the bar exam right now uh, within the United States? And we sort of reached up into Canada since it's a similar legal market. And we saw, th we saw three groups. We saw the, the true diploma privilege of Wisconsin and some of the emergency diploma privileges that were granted in the summer of 2020, like in Oregon, where if you take certain courses, you graduate from a law school, then they are the gatekeepers. You're licensed to practice law at that point with the character and fitness still being there. Um, we saw the New Hampshire model, which was a more rigorous experiential curriculum in law school that was also governed, that was still monitored by the Board of Bar Examiners though. So more of a hybrid where the Board of Bar Examiners still maintained that function of assessing competency. And then we saw the apprenticeship or supervised practice model, really the Canadian articling model, but that Utah and Washington DC adopted in the summer of 2020 also. So we broke into three subcommittees and those committees were tasked with deeply researching what was happening in those areas, talking with stakeholders there. So each subcommittee talked to practicing lawyers in those jurisdictions, uh, board of bar examiners in those jurisdictions, the court and um, law students and law schools in those jurisdictions with the goal of coming back to the group with a report of, is it working? Um, is it working well? And is it something that Oregon would want to adopt wholesale or consider tweaking to make it more Oregon, right? We, we never wanted to say, well, we're just looking for an off the shelf solution from another jurisdiction. These were the starting principles and how could Oregon adopt it to our legal market? And that culminated in our report to the court uh, where we recommended the two models that we, um, that we came up with. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so the, our materials have a link to the full report. I will say we, um, in looking at the three models, I don't wanna say that we wholesale rejected Wisconsin. The Wisconsin group came back with a lot of good um, support for Wisconsin. I think at the end of the day, though there was a strong concern about not maintaining um, 
regulators as the ultimate deciding factor as whether for whether a student was or an applicant was competent to practice law. And so with that, what happened is Wisconsin sort of got folded into the other two models. Uh, and what we what Oregon did reject, though, was that the law schools would be the deciding factor in whether applicants were competent. Um, that was a group decision. It was a unanimous group decision. Um, and with no disparagement to Wisconsin, I think it works very well in Wisconsin. I actually practiced law in Wisconsin for a period of time, but they're a small state with two schools and um, just sort of a different market and level of control with those schools. Uh, so, uh, so we came up with two pathways that Brian and I will talk about in more detail. Um, we call it the Oregon Experiential Pathway, which is similar to the New Hampshire model, um, although I would say with some Wisconsin sprinkled in, and then a supervised practice pathway, which is a um, more similar to a Canadian articling system, although with some tweaks to it uh, to address some of the concerns that we heard out of the Canadian system. One key factor that we also want to emphasize is Oregon has no intention of doing away with the UBE. So really what there are now are three pathways, or if the court adopted our proposal, there would be three pathways to licensure. Someone still could sit for the UBE exam. That was a decision made between the law schools and the BBX not that long ago that we should become a UBE state to allow applicants to have portable UBE scores. And that's not something that the Board of Bar Examiners wants to step away from. So that remains a pathway. What this does is open up other pathways to licensure in Oregon. Um, it also, at least as of now, the BBX is holding firm that there would still be a required MPRE um, and of course a character and fitness review. Um, one of the big things that jumped out to us though through this process is that the bar exam as it stands now is a very efficient way at measuring competence. You can test, you know, we test 500 people um, in the summer. California, I don't even know your numbers. I can't fathom what it is, but it's a lot higher. And it's, you know, one day, it's two days of testing and administering a test and then a grading session afterwards. Um, these alternatives will require additional resources. And in the implementation phase, um, we need to be working with the court and on how, where that comes from. Does it come from raising applicant fees? Does it come from the bar? Um, and we have ideas around that, but we certainly don't want to diminish the fact that the pathways we're considering will require additional staff or technology as we go forward. Um, and we need to be looking for those resources somewhere. So I think we can now jump into the Oregon experiential pathway on the next slide, which. Um, Dean Galini worked on that subcommittee and uh, drafted that section of the report. So I will let him take over completely here. That's great, thank you. Uh, so as, as Joe pointed out earlier, to some degree, the work we did was, was modeled, at least in the first instance, uh, by viewing the, or taking a hard look at the DWS, the Daniel Webster Scholars Program. And I know from, from your last meeting, you had an opportunity to hear about that, but just, just briefly to kind of orient you um, at a very movie trailer level. So the DWS program opened to students in, in January of 06 on a three-year pilot. It was limited to about 15 students uh, in each graduating class, and it's now a permanent fixture at the University of New Hampshire, and the number of students has increased to 24 per graduating class. And I think those numbers will become important in, in just a moment as we kind of carve out where OEP fits relative the DWS. Uh, the other structural things worth kind of pointing out at an introductory level are that students are selected for, for DWS uh, by a committee that, are, that is composed of professors, DWS graduates that look at a, kind of a holistic assessment of the applicant based on professional, interpersonal, and then the academic skills. And then students would apply in March of their first year. They're selected in June, and then it's a two-year pathway for the balance of their legal education that's focused on litigation. So to kind of put that intro framing off to the side or maybe underneath where OEP fits in, there's really two key differences between OEP versus DWS. And the first of which 
is it's not designed to be limited. In other words, it's not designed to be limited to those 24 students. It's not designed to be focused on a particular uh, academic credentialing process. And as you'll hear a little bit deeper in the presentation, that in part is what informs the OEP is fundamentally an, an equity initiative. And then second key difference is unlike the litigation focus uh, in the DWS program, we envision this as kind of a broader based set of opportunities. And this is a, a bit of a rough analogy, but similar to how we might apply uh, or how we might major in something in undergrad, there'd be opportunities at the law school curricular level to let law students kind of opt in to, again, analogously speaking, a major that would then drive their uh, experience in that back, the, uh, the back end of their legal education. So, so now let's drill a little bit, uh, a little bit down further. So, so at the core of the OEP is this recognition of the value of experiential learning. So we hear over and over again from our employers about the importance of graduating practice ready lawyers. And it strikes us that law schools are already across the country in a period of transformation, kind of moving from this traditional stand and deliver doctrinal focused set of courses into an enhanced focus on experiential education. And th this trend in some ways is not new. Uh, in 2015, for instance, the ABA for the first time mandated that every law school complete at least six credits of experiential learning. What I think in some ways is new is, is the difference between historically speaking since 2015, how law students have satisfied those uh, uh, credits versus what OEP would do. So very briefly, uh, historically speaking, students can satisfy their experiential credits through two fundamental pathways, uh, participation in a legal clinic or uh, in an externship. So the, the way that OEP thinks about this and these kind of re still relatively new ABA standards is that by establishing OEP, it not only affirms what the ABA is doing, but, but emphasizes its importance by expanding beyond law clinics and externships and, and offering the opportunity to satisfy these credits through simulation learning, which happens through, again, ABA accreditation, but really emphasizes the need for law schools to shift on a really systemic and large scale basis, uh, the curriculum and the offerings that support OEP. So then the question is, you know, where, where would we focus students in that regard? So it would be uh, the focus from a simulation standpoint on the completion of certain kind of practice-based benchmarks. And so we might think about the creation of documents, whether it's transactional or litigation, simulated client interviews, depositions, trial practice. Students might negotiate uh, for actual clients or represent them in court proceedings. The experiences could be supplemented by, by ethical issues in the context of problem-solving exercises, in addition to, to legal research, uh, reasoning and analysis in those upper-level classes. And the ideal the OEP then would really cultivate students' practice management skills along the way, how to address things like time constraints, appropriately manage deadlines. And they might do so by incorporating exercises around fee arrangements, engagement letters, timekeeping, billing, all of these things came up in the OEP uh, subcommittee. And I would add the uh, associated technology and the skills to, to exercise all of these. So collectively, the, the OEP model would really be, again, focused on preparing students to be admitted per, to practice. So upon successful completion of the program, we'd move to this capstone experience, this partnership with BBX, which as Joe points out is, is more resource intensive. And so students would be admitted to practice following graduation, clearance of character and fitness, and then complete, completion of this uh, capstone. And I'll just say a quick word on that. We would imagine this uh, implementation period as, as Joe points out, but from the law school kind of being informed uh, and I'll, I'll talk in a little bit more, uh, a couple slides down about what the curriculum might look like, but broadly speaking, foundational courses, but beyond the, the first year, what the experiential requirements are that uh, law schools could offer, again, kind of focused in that simulation learning space, and then that capstone project. And so you can kind of think about those three pillars as, as informing the core infrastructure of OEP. And we would imag imagine from the law school standpoint, Following the ramp up period, I, I don't want to overpromise and say we'll throw the gates open immediately because I think we want to have some time to be thinking about what that ramp up period looks like and how we serve students. But then once we figure that out, really opening it to all students who might opt in uh, and then really big picture thinking, trying to think through the replicable blueprint that would uh, allow for out of state schools to, to both use what we're doing as a model, but also importantly to apply 
once our program is up and running to do so through their own uh, standing up of a program. Sorry, I muted myself because I was coughing. Um, we can move to the next slide um, and uh, to talk about the supervised practice pathway. Um, so this pathway, we didn't have the same sort of clear starting point model that, uh, that the Oregon Experiential Pathway had because we were looking at a number of models. Um, as you may know, Canada is not a unified uh, system either. So different provinces have different articling models that we looked at. Um, certain of them, I think Ontario is more hands-on instruction-based, whereas Alberta is truly, you're just working in your articling section. Um, then we looked at Utah, which had a supervised practice component to their um, emergency COVID diploma privilege model. And then Washington, DC, which implemented as an emergency COVID practice model, a three-year supervised practice um, section. And where we landed on the supervised practice pathway, and I guess I'll just pause and um, before getting into the pathway, one thing that the task force as a whole, when we regrouped, came back to talk about, and this will come up a little bit more on the equity side, was that we did think that there needed to be more than one option. Um, both the OEP and the supervised practice pathways have certain equity concerns. We think they're both very valid ways to measure minimum competency to practice law, which is what's necessary on the consumer protection side. But in terms of our goal of not creating unnecessary barriers, we saw one way to address that is to give applicants choices between taking the bar exam, the OEP, or a supervised practice pathway, which is why the task force strongly recommends um, both of the alternative pathways rather than just one. Um, but with that, the supervised practice pathway allows for students who don't have the ability to take this intensive experiential curriculum in law school to have the opportunity to get training, not just I took it, I took the bar exam and now I'm ready to practice law, but a period of training under a practicing attorney for um, we didn't we haven't set the time limits yet that would be done at an implementation phase but we in the 1000 to 1500 hours of actual legal work um, with the goal of it being about nine months to a year of legal work if you think about you know an associate's billable requirements that first year of 2000 hours um, if you're only counting certain work though then to require 2000 hours would push well over the one year mark um, because the idea is not that you just sat in a chair for a year being under an attorney, it's that you're actually logging hands-on legal work. And so um, there will be if in, at the implementation stage, a discussion around what counts as legal work. Um, can you do a thousand hours of DACA review in your supervised practice? I think from the discussions we had on this subcommittee, the answer is probably no. Could you do some of it? Pro yes, but there will be caps on certain types of work that you can do to count towards this 1,000 to 1,500 hours, which is why it's lower than what you would think of as a normal billable year at 2,000 hours. Um, <coughs> there will also be, um, the idea is not is that for the supervised practice attorneys, for the attorneys who are doing the supervision, they will not, um, they can't be first year attorneys or second year attorneys. There will be um, standards that have to be met that will are similar to those standards for what a supervising attorney in Canada has to reach. Um, or one jurisdiction that we didn't look at closely since they still are a bar exam jurisdiction, but uh, at the implementation phase, we may look at more closely is Delaware, which has a supervised practice period following the bar exam. Um, and has some of these regulations spelled out for us that we may look to in terms of what does what is required of a supervising attorney in those um, in terms of years of practice and experience level. Um, the other thing that we have <coughs> um, the other piece of the Delaware model that we 
considering is Delaware. One concern we've heard on the supervised practice pathway is, well, if you go to work for a family court lawyer, your only experience to pass, to pass the bar or to become licensed will be in family court. And that was a concern that when we first presented this report to the Supreme Court, they raised, and it's a concern we've seen echoed in the um, public comments. And it's a valid concern because the bar exam tests a breadth of knowledge, whereas a supervised practice model, you could be only doing family court work or only doing criminal defense. In fact, that's likely what you would do is if you're working for one person, the type of work they do. Um, and the way Delaware has addressed this, I think, is really interesting and something that the task force is considering. They call it colloquially a scavenger hunt, but basically everyone in that period that in the, the, their supervised practice, they have to go see an oral argument at an appellate court. They have to draft a will. They have to run a title search, which I can tell you as a practicing attorney for 12 years, I've never run a title search and I have absolutely no clue how to run a title search. So um, the idea being that you get a breadth of experience in this training period, even if your entire time is spent working for in, in one narrow area of the law. Um, another change that we, or, or wh where we made it, where we made it an Oregon model, um, changing it from anything we saw at the, in Canada or in Utah or in DC, or even in Delaware, is that in the supervised practice pathway, again, the board of bar examiners is maintaining that control of being the assessor of minimum competency. So while the supervising attorney is mentoring and ensuring that work that's actually leaving their office doors in that year time is competent work, we would still be requiring a portfolio similar to the one being done in the OEP model to be provided to the board of bar examiners through the process to ensure, again, minimum competency and maintaining that control at the BBX level um, so, that you, the, so that disparity in the supervising attorneys would not lead to disparity in determining whether an applicant is minimally competent to practice law. Um, <coughs> we do envision that it would be available to out-of-state applicants. Um, and as Dean Galini mentioned, eventually the OEP program, we would envision being available to out-of-state applicants too, but that's gonna take longer. And um, while Wisconsin has not ever, while it has not been determined that the Wisconsin model violates the Dormant Commerce Clause, there are certainly enough law review articles and a case out there that suggests it that we didn't wanna wade into that area. So by having pathways that are open to um, out-of-state attorneys, we think we can avoid the issue of even having to litigate that case in the Ninth Circuit, um, like has happened to Wisconsin. So the, the, the out-of-state piece is one um, that did weigh on our minds and um, I know continues to weigh on Wisconsin's mind as well. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, in terms of addressing consumer protection concerns, I think Dean Gleaney and I both talked about these somewhat. Um, the big thing, and, and we're in the public comment period, so I think Dean Galini and I both spent several hours reading these public comments and can say, hands down, one of the biggest comments we see over and over again, as Dean Galini alluded to, is you're lowering the bar. You're Now you're just going to let in everyone, and you're going to ruin the um, dignity of the profession. And um, we're really trying to get the message across, because I, as the task force thought about, is that's clearly not the goal. The goal is still to have the same bar for someone to determine whether they're minimally competent. They're just proving it through a different pathway. They're proving it through um, a year of work or they're proving it through the experiential learning in law school. And they're still proving it through submitting work product to the board of bar examiners. So whether it's a timed hour and a half MPT that they happen to take in the convention center or you know, a mock deposition and a summary judgment brief, it's the same group of people who will be assessing whether 
that person is minimally competent to practice law in the state of Oregon. Um, and as I alluded to before, it was important to the task force. It's important to the Oregon BBX. Um, and I think it's seeing these public comments, it's important to a lot of our bar members as well that we're not outsourcing the decision on min minimum competency because there are, it is challenging. And we heard this from Wisconsin professors. It is challenging to be an applicant's professor and be in a mentorship role to that person and be their teacher and then be the same person who says, but you failed my class, so you're not gonna be competent to practice law. And we don't want that pressure on those professors. We don't want professors maybe fudging at the lines, not that they would or not that they do, but there is a, you can see a, a conflict there and a desire to say, well, I really like this student and they're close enough, so I'm gonna push them through. We think that there is value in that arm's length uh, relationship between a BBX member and an applicant in the determining of competence to practice law. <coughs> um, and then the other area where we've seen, as I mentioned before, is you know the breadth of knowledge. Are these people gonna be overly focused and not, you know, there's some value. I never took, um, I never took secured transactions in law school. I never took family law in law school. And, take the bar, I still had to study those. And, um, you know, in a case not too long ago, the UCC came up and I at least knew enough to know where to look, right? And so how do we maintain that breadth of knowledge issue? And um, Dean Galini, do you wanna to speak to that a little bit in the OEP? Well, that'd be great, thank you. Very briefly, I would have you kind of focus your attention on four large buckets in terms of how we're, we've thought about the OEP curriculum. And I think on this point of, you know, lowering the bar and <coughs> sort of letting everyone through. I at least like to say, if you like a two-day bar, how about a two-year bar? And, and I think that's largely what informs the way we've approached thinking about the curriculum. So bucket one is pretty straightforward. It's your first year courses. Bucket two would be foundational courses beyond the first year. So things like PR, evidence, um, su successful completion of the graduate writing requirement, perhaps a selection of particular uh, classes like state and local governments, legislation, statutory interpretation, uh, crim pro, business associations, family law. So core courses, uh, foundational courses beyond the first year would be bucket two. Bucket three would be the experiential requirements. And as, as is contemplated, at least by the blueprint in the OEP proposal, the devil really is in the details here in terms of double clicking and finding out how much law school curricula would have to change and how much innovation would have to take place. And I would just briefly note on that front, really two bullets. So students would have to successfully complete no fewer than nine credits of either closely supervised clinical work or simulation coursework, and then successful completion of up to six credits of externship work. And when you focus in on that language, it's really putting the pressure on law schools to enhance particular framings of what counts as experiential. And what OEP does is it, is it highlights the importance of either clinical, or as I mentioned earlier, simulation work, and to some degree reduces the number of credits that would, for, for, for at least some stakeholders, think of externships sort of outsourcing the experiential. And so it, it seeks to cap the, uh, the student's ability to do that. And then bucket four would be this capstone requirement, which as we've discussed would be the in development with uh, the OEP implementation task force. But, but I would just briefly say that it, it is a true partnership as Joe pointed out with BBX and we could at least on the law school side, imagine the creation of performance tests using case files or a, a limited universe of materials or a project that uh, uh, relied on a rubric generated by, by the task force, which could then in the advising space, help create a curricular planning tool for students and then permit the development of capstone portfolios that would begin in the fall of the student's 2L year. And the last thing I would just say about this is that when you kind of, I get asked this at least a lot, which is okay, if, it's, if it really is a two-year bar and you're imposing all of these requirements, you know, what's left for, for students to take beyond these curricular impositions? And, and I would offer just very two brief comments on that. One of which is law schools at the margins are requiring bar classes anyway. So, one kind of, and this is maybe me kind of casting off that difficult question a little bit too too casually, but but we're doing that in some ways already, and that's not an excuse. But but then the second and maybe more responsive 
point I might make is in total, the entirety of those four buckets at the OEB, OEP proposal level, depending on how you count them, ranges between 65 to 69 credits. So uh, because an ABA uh, accreditation standards require 83 credits of academic work to secure a JD, so your back of the envelope course requirements in this example would permit 14 credits, or in other words, an entire semester of completely elective courses. And in my view, that's even more than in some ways what a restrictive degree audit that's uniquely focused on what is now a traditional bar exam would permit. Um, yeah, and ju so just briefly to address it from the SPP angle, um, again, that in terms of maintaining the, uh, the rigor, um, the SPP envisions a portfolio or a capstone um, compilation of work similar to the OEP model. And I think at the end of the day, we will likely use psychometricians to come up with similar rubrics to grade both so that there is a unified grading model between the two portfolios um, envisioned. And then in terms of the breadth, uh, certainly the OEP has the breadth of knowledge built in through the different courses that have to be taken. Again, in the SPP model, that's, that is more difficult unless we do impose some curricular requirements to apply for the model, which hasn't been discussed at this point. And so at this point, it's be, the, the considerations are either through CLE requirements or through that scavenger hunt um, model adopted from Delaware, just to ensure that applicants are still maintaining that breadth that you get from having to sit down and study the UCC, even if you avoided it for three years in law school. Um, so if we, if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about how we are addressing equity concerns in these um, different models. And as I said, as I started talking about the SPP, we really think the, the overarching way to address equity concerns is by having more than one option for applicants. Um, but uh, Dean Galini, I'll let you talk first on the OEP model and equity concerns. Yeah, just very briefly in mind for time, I think this at its core, this being OEP and the broader conversation around alternatives to licensure really is an equity initiative. And we were really, I think, simultaneously as a task force alarmed and energized at the same time, as much as those may seem conflicting when the ABA data came out uh, over the summer and reflected that for 2020, you know, they, they provided three year 2020, 2019 and 2018 aggregate data around first time bar pass rate across ethnicity. And just, you know, a, a, a sampling of that data reflected that, for example, in 2020, 88% of white bar takers passed compared to 66% of black bar takers and 76% of Hispanic bar takers. And so this idea of holistic licensure is really at the core of perhaps not disrupting the need, as Joe pointed out, for a portable score, but recognizing the importance of alternatives because we have to wrestle with those difficult statistics and not assume that continuing to do business as usual is acceptable if we're going to address what seems to be a quite uh, noticeable disparity in licensure. So, you know, how do we do this? I think we've been talking a lot about uh, leaning into these alternatives, but one thing that we haven't to, to address equity, but one thing we haven't talked about that I think OEP challenges law schools to think about, and I've gotten, uh, uh, a bit of pushback on this and appropriately so, but it, I think it's going to help law schools or challenge law schools to think carefully about admission consequences and admission policies. So I think there's a drop down here, a drop down menu here that challenges law schools to be increasingly encouraged to think about admitting law schools on, a, on more than an evaluation of LSAT and GPA. And I think the academy has done a better job over the last several years in doing so, but I don't think the work is done. And so thinking about reliance on inclusive criteria for admission, uh, including work experience or life experience, overcoming personal challenges, I think law schools will be inherently encouraged to do that if they have the confidence that uh, law students, all of them can apply for the OEP. And speaking from, you know, taking for a moment my uh, alternatives to licensure uh, task force hat off for, for just a second and putting my, you know, Willamette Law Dean hat on, you know, thinking a lot about this relationship in that chair between you know, LSATs and GPAs and how it ties 
empirically to bar passage, I, I get to set that down as, as one law dean and really think critically about with, without that uh, kind of hanging over these bar pass consequences of admission as it's currently framed and think about what that looks like from an admission space. So I just didn't want to lose the chance to point out that, that these conversations have, have extended beyond the, the core of equitable admission in the, uh, the licensure space. I like to think of them as helping us think from admission to admission. Um, and for equity on the SPP, I will say there are real valid concerns around a, a supervised practice model on equity. Um, in kicking off the task force, I spoke with Dean Hall Ian Holloway from uh, University of Calgary, who speaks on the topic a lot to actually abolish articling for this very reason in Canada, or at least makes significant changes to it. Um, the two key problems people feel, um, one being that applicants can feel trapped with a bad supervisor. You're, you're articling under someone and it does give a, a lot more power even than in a normal employer employee relationship if this person holds your licensing um, in their hands. And so one, the, the task force explicitly has said in recommending this program we would allow for multiple supervisors. And, and that's why we have that hours requirement and not just you must be under a supervisor for a year, but you must do supervised legal work for these number of hours. Um, obviously that we saw that as a big concern. You don't wanna give someone that much power over someone's life and career. And then um, as could be expected, there are um, equity concerns with finding supervisors. There are, you know, first generation law students have a much harder time finding someone to supervise them in a supervised practice model than someone who comes from a family of eight lawyers um, who can reach out to different connections. And Oregon currently has a mentorship program through the bar for every single first year attorney. And so we are trying to work closely with the bar to see how that program could get leveraged into supervisor um, relationships. We're also considering whether if someone wants to be a supervising attorney, they also have to um, agree to certain DEI initiatives within their firm. Um, and so we're looking at a number of different models around that, but they are certainly things that are forefront in our mind um, and have been from the day, from the day we, I spoke to Dean Holloway and the day we, we kicked off the, this aspect of the task force. So if we can just go to the last slide to talk about next steps and where we are now. Um, as I mentioned, we are still in a public comment phase. The court has not adopted these, adopted the report. Um, the task force is actually conducting, drafting supplemental reports to address the public comments we've seen and certain specific questions that we've received from the court about um, how these, mod mainly about how these models will maintain the same rigor as the, um, as the bar exam and measure competence in the same way. So we expect to have a supplemental report by December to the court and then have the court take up this issue again. Um, there, we did hold public comments open for about two months um, and received quite a bit of commentary. Um, all of them, all of them expressing valid concerns, some more articulately and thoughtful than others, but um, you know, we can appreciate that member, this is a big change for our members of the bar and we want to hear those comments and, and take them seriously. Um, and I hear comments sort of informally all the time. I'm sure Dean Galini does too, because both of our names were out there with it. I, I heard comments at my daughter's soccer game from a, another preschool mom who's a lawyer, um, who's actually the person who turned us on to looking at Delaware because she's a Delaware lawyer. So I think I've, we've encouraged the whole task force to be having these tough conversations with colleagues and, and people because uh, all it can do is make our proposal better going forward. If the court does move forward with the proposals, there will be a significant implementation phase where we're looking at curriculums and qualifications and the items listed on this slide. Um, I'm not sure we need to go too deep into that. I, I know we're running out on time, but so that would be assuming the court adopt if the court adopts the recommendations then there will be at least a year or, or more with more public comment um, to get these these programs up and running
Thank you so much, both of you, for the excellent presentation. And I know that other members, I'm sure, will find it very informative. It's very interesting, the alternative pathways that you've developed. I, I would like to open it up if you're available for uh, questions from members. And it looks like we already have a couple of hands up. I, I just I, I just wanted to um, add, but I'll go after Neil. So it looks like we have Emily first and then Neil. Thanks, Justice. And uh, thank you so much to both of you for your presentation. It was very, very helpful. Um, and it sounds like you all have just done a lot of work on this and we're, we're benefiting from that. So thank you. Um, my question uh, relates to both uh, the um, sort of experiential pathway and also the practice pathway, which is, has there been discussion with law schools and also maybe with lawyers in the community about how this all kind of financially works out um, and whether or not, uh, for example, the supervising attorneys are paying the um, uh, applicants to do these hours and kind of what that level of pay looks like. Um, we have pretty strict labor laws in California. And so that would be something that we would have to certainly look at and address. Um, and then also just with the law schools um, taking on a lot of the, now we're going to have to train the 2Ls and 3Ls and kind of upgrade essentially the clinical side. I mean, this is obviously not a new issue, but if we are gonna go from six units to two years, essentially to, to get, you know, it's not two years, but to have this, this operating this much, um, you know, how are we, how are, how is Oregon expecting the Oregon law schools to pay for this? And is there a partnership there? Thanks. Um, so I, I will talk from the, on the supervised practice side and from the bars perspective, and I'll let Dean Galini, although I have had conversations with um, law schools on the, on the cost. Um, but so in terms of the supervised practice model, we would expect them um, to pay the applicants while they're working. I mean, they're getting legal work out of these applicants. Oregon also has a very expansive student practice rule that can that would allow um, these individuals to um, appear in court, uh, even under its current form. And, and it, we could certainly see changing it or expanding it even further should this model go into place. But even under its current form, um, someone for up to I can't remember if it's 12 or 18 months after graduation, can appear in court for certain types of hearings, can assist in drafting wills, can do quite a bit of um, actual legal work. And, and that's the type of legal work we would be expecting for them to be gaining their hours. And, and that is real work and value to these supervisors. So um, we wouldn't expect the pay to be commensurate with an actual first year associate because they're not barred and, and that is a difference. But we would, ex um, we would expect and require that supervising attorneys pay the applicants, you know, a fair wage. I heard um, certain horror stories out of DC that of lawyer supervising attorneys asking that applicants pay them to be supervised. And that is something that um, I just, our state bar wouldn't, would not stand for that. Um, in terms of, this is sort of outside your question, but on the money front, the, it's also going to require resources from the bar. And I think we see um, there will be at least some increase in the application fees for, I think, almost certainly for applicants going through these routes because they're saving, you know, they're getting back three months of, of work time by not studying for the bar. They're not paying for Barbary. We're not saying it's going to increase by $2,000 or the cost of Barbary, but if it increases even by a couple hundred dollars per applicant, we think that that could pencil out from the bar's perspective on a budget. It's an excellent question from the law school's standpoint. And I'm going to start with the line that's, that's uniformly unpopular uh, when I say it, which is that, you know, law schools don't have to participate. So it, it's a choice. And you know, I, when I've used that line before, I get pushed back. Well, how can we not? And I guess, you know, from my view, yes, it's going to cost money, but but lost in, in <laughs> the binary in that framing is the fact that law schools make investment choices every day. 
And I think what this proposal does is it forces law schools to, to put their money where their mouths are from an equity standpoint, from a curricular standpoint, and from a preparation of students standpoint. So I hear all the time that our employers want practice ready lawyers, that they're disappointed with first and second year attorneys and feel like they invest inordinate resources in the training. We can do that. We have the infrastructure to do that. We also know our students want this. Our simulation based classes are oversubscribed consistently. So when we know that lawyers want this, we know that students want this, then it makes sense, I think, from uh, an investment standpoint. But I'm not going to hide that I'm not going to run from the fact that it is a monstrous holistic shift in the way that a law school delivers a legal education that will take time and it's not going to be perfect at the outset. It may be bumpy, but that's not a reason not to move forward in my view. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Neil? Thanks, Justice Guerrero. Um, so I, I had two questions related to the supervised practice program. Um, my first is, is um, what, 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 what was the thinking behind setting it between 1,000 and 1,500 hours? And second, um, how, how do you plan on dealing with potential attorney client and work product privilege issues in terms of turning the work product over to the board of examiners? Yeah, so those are both great questions. The hours requirement, what we were aiming for is nine months to a year of actual legal work. So sort of if you cut out some of the, the fluff that you may include in your billable, not fluff, real work, but not, not what we would call legal work. And so we, we took a 2000 hour billable year and said, what you're probably doing to get to nine months to a year is more like a thousand to fifteen hundred of, of research and writing and meeting with clients and um, you know as I said in the presentation probably some of it could be doc review but I don't think we would accept fifteen hundred hours of clicking through is this responsive or not um, right sort of first level doc review so that was the thinking on the timing the work product question is a great question and. Um, one that we'll deal with more in depth at the um, at the implementation phase, but I see it as um, similar to when I have an associate work for me between 2L and 3L year. I know they need to leave with a writing sample. And so I make sure that they have a memo or something they can walk out my doors with that's not a client privilege document. Um, and so there may be extraneous work you know, work that's not directly tied to a client that these applicants have to do for their portfolio to make it happen, um, or they may need some sort of client waiver on that. Uh, but we think that the value of being admitted is is probably worth the extra hours of that research memo or, or whatever they're using to submit, um, just like the summer associate does when they, you know, write the, write the memo to have a writing sample for clerkships or, or whatever they're applying to next. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Neil. I have just a couple of points of clarification and then an additional question. Um, the clarification relates to a slide in the presentation indicating that feedback from the board of bar examiners uh, would allow for correction if students weren't meeting um, the standards. And I was just wondering logistically how that would work. And then also how out of state applicants, how it would be available to them. There was a a reference that they could apply, but I wasn't sure logistically how that would work. And then the other question was related to both the experiential and supervision components. If there were any concerns about the quality and availability and access, who would have uh, access to better quality supervision or better externship experiences? And if that was a concern, uh, how that would be addressed. Yeah, um, so Dean Galini, I don't know if you want to take the first two clarifications or I'm happy to, they're on the on the OAP slide. Um, the, the idea that there would be a, allow for course correction from feedback from the BBX in the um, Daniel Webster Scholars Program, which we would also do here, a BBX member would be assigned starting that 2L year to review portions of the capstone and provide feedback 
on a semester by semester basis. Um, so if someone is, you know, way off track with what is acceptable work at the end of fall 2L semester, they will hear that from a BBX member. Um, probably, again, thanks to that arm's length relationship, maybe in harsher terms than they would from a professor of, you know, th this is not acceptable work and, and needs to change before your for before your full capstone portfolio is submitted. But the idea would be that BBX members are um, engaged uh, to some level beginning in the 2L year of the applicant. And Joe, just quickly, I might add on that yeah. point, it, it really focuses the attention on the importance from the law school's perspective on advising and who's actually coordinating the program to ensure the academic component on the one hand, the, the faculty's role and <laughs> the component on the other, and having someone really focused on bringing those two things together and helping the student through their curriculum to pull both of the threads. And I think that's one of the areas that we spend a lot of time on the subcommittee, the OEP subcommittee is recognizing that from a law school resource standpoint, it's probably not gonna be enough for faculty wholly apart from shifting classes to just do business as usual. We're really gonna have to have someone who's charged with thinking about this program and running it on a full-time basis. Um, in terms of the out-of-state applicants, for the OEP program, we would envision that on a school-by-school -school basis. So again, starting with the Oregon schools with whom we have, the, um, the Oregon State Bar already has a very close relationship with our Oregon schools. We meet with them every other week and talk about various issues. So starting with them, but then if a school said, I have enough people who want to go to Oregon to practice law, then we would start working with those schools as well on the program. But it wouldn't, at least as envisioned now, it would not be a one-off applicant from NYU. It would be, you know, maybe UW up in Washington saying, okay, we have enough people going to Oregon that this is worth it for us to change our curriculum. Can we work with you like the Oregon schools do? Um, And I'm sorry, I've now completely forgotten your question. Well, that's I, okay. I can um, help with the third one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. So, so very briefly, in the <laughs> front, there was a significant concern about this, which is, as you may recall in the OEP, and this was one of, I would argue, the most controversial pieces of it was to place a cap on externships to deal with the point that I think is you're spot on, the potential for differential experiences for students. So the OEP contemplates an externship cap of no more than six credits. That's quite different from at least at, at my home school at Willamette, students wholly apart from OEP, they could earn up to 20 credits of externship. So we really are being very intentional on the OEP front about recognizing this differential experiential experience at the externship level by drilling down on the number of available credits. Um, and on the, now I remember the question, on the SPP side, in terms of quality of supervisors, um, that is a big concern. And, and as I mentioned, that, that's one of those concerns Dean Holloway raised with me at the very outset before I even kicked off the task force. Um, so we would expect certain fairly stringent requirements before someone could become a supervisor and um, training on what that means. Uh, but also, and, and I think I will just acknowledge this from the jump, Oregon as a smaller state has a advantage over a larger state like California in this regard. We have already have a system in which there is a dedicated group of mentors through the Oregon State Bar paired with every single new attorney in the state. And um, our state bar president is already working and thinking about how we could leverage that group of committed individuals into maybe turning them into supervising attorneys or um, working through existing channels that we already have in that mentorship set up to make the supervised practice model uh, work in that way, because it is a concern over there as well. Thank you very much. Susan and then Donna. Thank you. These options are both creative and I'm very happy to see them so fully developed at such an early stage, but I have a question that I could see as a point of concern of, by folks who don't favor these kinds of options, and that would be 
how are you going to ensure that these portfolio submissions and that the work submitted to the state bar is actually the work of that applicant? Um, yeah, I think that's a tough question. Um, one we deal with on the BBX a lot when we think about how stringent our cheating requirements are, right? Because it's kind of wild that we, you know, we put so much trust in lawyers and so little trust in applicants. Um, I think from the SPP model, we would expect a, you know, any supervising attorney is a barred attorney and it would be, they're going to be signing off saying what my supervisee is submitting is their work. And so um, I think you would run into serious disciplinary issues for lying to the bar at that point. And, and we're just relying on our own internal disciplinary system to mon and, and trusting our attorneys to monitor on that regard. Um, I think on the SPP side, you do have that, that sort of hammer over the supervisor's head of, you know, this is discipline worthy conduct to lie to us about hours worked or whether this is the applicant's work product. Um, I think the same probably goes for the professors, but I'll let Dean Gleaney talk about if that was considered at the OEP side. No, definitely. I think that the advantage that OEP has <coughs> from is before its work product to be considered for licensure, it's work product to be considered for graduation. And because of that, there is a stringent and very serious honor code that hangs over every student's academic work, whether it's for OEP or anything else. And having a robust internal honor code that precedes the ability to even be licensed, I think is a critical tool that helps ideally give us some confidence that as a law school, we've been doing this for decades in terms of you know, monitoring a student's work product. And this is to some degree, no different, although with one, I think, important caveat, which loops back to this importance of advising. So having someone charged with running this program to monitor the student's work and to help unify it with the BBX collaboration and make sure the student understands that, yes, it's submission for licensure. But again, there's no discussion of licensure until you graduate. And, and that's still very much in the, the college's, the law school's uh, prerogative. Thank you both. Thank you. Donna, did you no longer have a question? You're on mute, but. Sorry, Susan largely asked the question that I was, uh, that, I was okay. uh, that I was thinking of. So thank you, I'm good. Thank you. Alex? Hi, um, was there an empirical study done in determining the hour requirement for the supervised practice pathway? Um, I'm just doing the math right now in my head and you would convert the 1,000 to 1,500 hours in two months, then we're really looking at six to nine months. So in other words, what factors did Oregon use in arriving at this six to nine month requirement? Um, the second part of this question is whether there's a timeline under which the applicant must complete this requirement. And I only ask that because, as you know, we have more than 50 California accredited and non-accredited law schools. And a lot of the applicants work <laughs> full-time in a non-legal setting or choose law as a second career. So really, there's a lot of factors that we have to consider to make sure that they are not excluded from participation, um, either because they can't quit the job or they can't find a legal job you know, in, in the market. Um, yeah, so just taking the second question first, that has not been determined yet and will probably be a discussion at the implementation side of sort of what length of time of someone can spread these hours out over. Um, at this stage, we did talk about allowing students to count some percentage of their time from loss, like summer jobs or externships in law school, but nothing was set in stone. The, the, the 1,000 to 1,500 hours, there wasn't a firm empirical study. We looked at what was the normal in Canada. We looked at what was happening in Washington, DC and Utah um, and came up with what we were aiming for was nine months to a year, but um, we did not, which would be more like 1500 to 2000 hours if you count every minute of, you know, billable time. With the thinking on 1000 to 1500 is that we, at least as the subcommittee saw it, there would be stricter requirements for what is legal work than what is billable work, that it would have to be, um, more hands-on research, writing, um, you know, your time compiling a binder while I, you may bill that to a client because it is what you need to do to get out the door to a hearing. 
we would not count that as legal hours. And so we cut the hours thinking a year of bill, a year of billable work looks more like 1000 to 1500 hours of the legal work that the, the, um, the program would actually require. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy and then Amy. Good morning and thank you again for your information. Um, kind of building off the, the uh, prior question, I was curious, was there um, an empirical study done to link these alternative pathways to the Oregon uh, either job analysis or practice analysis for attorneys? And have you worked with um, a psychometrician throughout the process? Thank you. Um, so we have, we did not do anything specific about the Oregon job, a job market analysis. We did, we have talked, um, for years in Oregon about our geographic diversity and getting lawyers out into the rural regions that I think is probably an issue California is facing, um, maybe less so than Oregon because we have so much rural territory, but really with, um, retirements coming up, we have a big concern about, you know, who's going to be working in Grants Pass or Pendleton in, in a few years. There are, there are a lot of markets that are largely dwindling. And the we have talked about how the supervised practice model may help pull people out, because you if you do your supervised practice here in one of these rural areas, you know, it's just more likely that you may stick around out there. Um, in terms of a psychometrician, we have not started working with a psychometrician yet. Um, but will be as soon as we start developing rubrics for the portfolios. At this point, we're waiting for the court to fully approve it and move us into implementation. And then psychometricians will be engaged heavily for you know, work product assessment. Okay, thank you. And just to, to clarify, when I talked about a job analysis, occupational analysis, I was speaking from a perspective of a psychometrician. So oh. I see that you've identified your competencies but typically there's a large scale study of the task and knowledge is required for practice. Uh, it would be for Oregon attorneys. And so you use that data to support these alternative pathways. And then that helps equate the various pathways to your exam. So something to think about because it's really important that any um, mechanism used to determine competency being be linked back to that that study um, and so that kind of will link all of your pathways and show how it's related to competency so thank you thank you amy thank you so much um, and i wanted to thank joanna and brian for your time today because i have really resonated what you were saying really resonated with me with regards to what constitutes the legal work, um, who is going to validate that that work is being done? I mean, there's a difference between preparing a form, actual writing a legal brief, and then what concerns me most out of all of this in the general perspective is where is that, where is that individual going to learn critical analysis? If he's not going to law school and let's say he's uh, you know writing for the exam or he's he's doing the other alternative method instead of going to a law school working under an attorney that that's one of my major concerns is where is that critical analysis going to be learned so um i'm sorry if that wasn't clear these are alternatives for law school graduates we currently don't have a um writing for the law pathway although it's being considered that is not a all Oregon applicants have to have graduated from an accredited Oregon law school. Okay. So and the, the supervised practice would come after graduation. Okay, perfect. And so who is going to validate what kind of work is being done? Because there's a difference between checkmarking boxes on a form and actually writing a legal brief or yes. writing a motion. Yeah. And we will, um, you know, as we develop the implement through the implementation committee, the we would expect them to keep time like you would, and maybe like you would have to if you have a, a more diligent reviewing client who said where you're saying exactly what you're doing for what time. 
um, and breaking breaking it out. So you know, writing a legal brief would have to be separated on those timesheets from um, filling out forms. And and we agree that, you, that which is exactly why we have the reduced hours from the full two thousand for a year. That the legal work has to be true legal work and not just maybe general billable work. Um, we would expect that to be validated by the supervising attorney who's tying their bar card number to saying, yes, this is accurate and true. Kind of like the, the concern about, is this the applicant's work product? Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Leah? Hi, um, thank you for this really interesting uh, presentation. I have a question about the decision to retain the UBE as one of the options. I really understand um, and appreciate the idea of having choice and, and the portability factor. <coughs> but some of the like the IELTS objectives that you identified, you know, they're quite different, I think, than what currently is uh, assessed in the UBE. Did you do an independent assessment of sort of the um, for lack of a better term, the validity of the UBE vis-a-vis -vis the skills and, and content knowledge that you think Oregon um, attorneys need to know and determine that it, it does meet your requirements? Or was it more about wanting to provide this uh, alternative pathway, the UBE, that has the benefit of the portability in terms of making the decision to retain it? So at this point, the, the what the court charged the task force to do was consider alternatives and not consider the validity of the UBE. Um, it was the year before I joined the board. So it, I think it was 2017. The board and the law schools went through an extensive discussion and, and study in determining to adopt the UBE in, a, in, in decision and the court, sorry, the court was also very clearly part of that conversation in deciding that the UBE was a valid measure of competence in Oregon. And so we relied on that decision from 2017 in saying we're going to, we're keeping this. And then this was considering the alternatives. Thank you. Ryan? Yes, uh, my concern is that um, this example of, of this. Um, you know, works, you, you do a number of hours of work, you're supervised by an attorney and you can get admitted to practice law. Um, my concern is, well, what if the attorney that's supervising this new um, candidate is not a very good attorney? Like what if they're not getting a lot of, uh, you know, quality direction in law practice and yeah, they're signing off on the hours. Is there some type of system in place for you guys to review the, the work perform um, somebody you could say okay this is a good example of, of legal work this candidate or applicant knows um, how to perform good solid legal work um, so that's the first part of that question is the system you have in place to ensure the quality quality control I guess system and then the second part is how does that translate to other practices like for example um, you know a practice that doesn't involve filing motions in court or, or, or complaints you know <laughs> negotiating business agreements and things like that. Yeah, so that's a great question and it was absolutely forefront of our mind. Um, under the SPP model, as currently envisioned, there would still be a portfolio component where the Board of Bar Examiners continues to be the deciding factor in whether someone is competent to practice law. So they have to get their hours, but they also have to submit work product to the Board of Bar Examiners for assessment. Um, in terms of non-litigation and what that really in terms of what that portfolio looks like overall it this comes in the implementation phase where we intend to work with a um, psychometrician to help us determine what is that portfolio how is it being um, assessed we're tuned to the fact that you know a business lawyer may not have a, a um, about a motion that they can give us, but they may have an issue that they had to research and write a memo on, or they may have an issue they didn't have to write the memo on, but they did because they knew they had to turn it in for a portfolio. So um, we just, we think that all practice areas will lend themselves to some level of analysis and written product that can be assessed by the Board of Bar Examiners. Um, and I guess for the few that don't, they're gonna have to do some extra work to show us legal analysis somewhere. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And thank you everyone for your questions. Again, we really do appreciate your time and especially given the circumstances of coming back and speaking with us, it was very informative for our group. <laughs> Good luck to you on the rest Thank of you. your endeavors. Good luck. Thank you for having us. Thank you. At this time, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item in the on the agenda, which is a discussion of um, where we go from now. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, more of an open discussion about your views as to what you would like to see the um, BRC recommends. And um, as a reminder, the key decision points that we have to make are whether we adopt a California specific approach or sign on to adopt the UBE, the next generation UBE, and whether we adopt a licensing examination or some type of alternative measure of competency for admission to the bar. Um, I was just jotting down everyone's names and I, I don't know if you wanna go in order as you appear on the screen, or uh, I don't want to call on you if you're not ready to speak either. So maybe I'll ask for volunteers who, who wants to go first, keeping in mind that we would like to be able to get to everybody who's here and wants to participate. Again, also keeping in mind that these may be preliminary views, but uh, I'd like to know what the recommended approaches that you would like us to adopt and why and the benefits of your proposed approach and anything else that you would like to discuss with the group. So we do have two volunteers and thank you both. Um, I'll start with Emily and then Susan. Thank you so much. And I actually, uh, I'm fine talking about what I think, but I wanted to just clarify our options. And I think I can share my screen, but I wanna make sure that was okay to, to do that. Yes. Um, okay. Let's see. I don't think I don't think the PowerPoint is actually coming up, but um, I I think that there are. I mean, I I may be getting some of this incorrect, but I wanted to make sure that this is what is correct. So we have it looks like fifteen options. <laughs> There's probably more, but we're talking about an exam. Whether we're doing an exam, which would be UBE or California. Certainly we could adopt something where there's a UBE plus a California specific the way New York did. If we decide we wanna to go to an alternative and not have an exam, we've looked at, I think three, I've combined maybe some, but there's the diploma privilege, which just basically if you graduate from X law school, you're in. If you, there's the 2L, 3L sort of experiential or clinical model that we just heard one piece from, but also have heard others about, and then the sort of a supervised practice apprenticeship. And then the, the other sort of nine options are just sort of riffing off of those, right? So you've got, you know, could we have a UBE and then also a diploma privilege? Could we have a California specific exam and then also have supervised practice? So you could combine some of these. And I just wanted to set that up to make sure that if there's anything else that people are thinking about, and certainly Right now in California, you could work in a judge's office or a lawyer's office without going to law school. So we're not touching necessarily that option, but I think these are the options that we're thinking about. And if, there, if I'm missing something, it would be great to know that. So that's, that's all I sort of wanted to say at this point, and I will stop talking. There we go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's just a, a number of different alternatives and even within each there's different considerations I and mean, one of the alternatives or considerations is keeping the general framework of a licensing exam, but modifying components of it. So there could be modifications to the existing bar exam where you make concrete changes, um, but keep the format, for example, increasing the amount of time or modifying the multiple choice component of it, um, moving towards more performance tests. So there's a lot that we can, we can talk about, um, but it is helpful. And I thank you for that visual of the different alternative pathways. It, it is something that it kind of underscores the 
the different um, considerations and and how we can develop different alternatives. Susan. Thank you. Um, I'll agree to go first just because I seem to go first all the time because I am the first letter of the alphabet. So um, to open our discussion, so I'd like to start with today is basically that I've, I've stressed to everyone who's asked me about this commission that I think it's important to maintain an open mind. And I think people have been surprised that I've said that because long prior to this commission, long prior to COVID, I have been an active critic of the bar exam. I've written op-ed pieces that have been critical of how the Supreme Court handled the COVID crisis. And I've been very opinionated for lack of a better word. And so I think people often think that that means I have a very set criteria that I have come to the commission with. And instead I've made an active effort in all of our initial meetings and have found these presentations to be helpful in terms of trying to keep that open mind to alternatives. That said, um, I do think California needs to be a leader. I think we're a great state. I'm a California lawyer. I'm a California native. It's time we lead. It is time we create something so great that other jurisdictions follow us. And I do think that means we need non-exam alternatives. And I do think that very specifically means um, a couple of things that I personally think are important for our discussion. I disfavor NCBE products. I disfavor traditional bar exams. Um, I disfavor creating a California specific exam, but I also disfavor a pure diploma privilege. So I hope we are going to look at these more kind of creative options, some real pathways forward where California can model a truly better option. I do think supervision practice options are good. I do think in law school options are good. I was encouraged by hearing the Oregon options today. I will say that law schools are going to express concerns about cost. And we heard some discussion about that today. Experiential opportunities are very expensive, but I think it was very important as an academic to emphasize that one of the things we heard today was that simulations will also qualify. And that is a big way to keep the cost within an affordable range. I do think we need something for attorneys from other jurisdictions to become California attorneys. And so perhaps the UBE has a role to play there. So at the end of our last meeting, you asked us to consider what we would consider to be an ideal solution. My ideal solution includes lots of things. The first one would be the elimination of the California bar exam. The second would be that we favor multiple options and pathways to practice that are cost effective, that are reasonable for applicants to meet, but most importantly are fair and move toward the diversity, equity, and inclusion goals that everybody has valued as important on this commission. I do think it's important that our options model real reform and that we become a way to lead for other jurisdictions. And I'll end with one final point, that we not be afraid of our size. The fact that some of these programs may be difficult to scale, difficult to fund, I hope we still hold on to our ideals and get done an ideal model program that other jurisdictions want to follow. Thank you, Susan. Ryan? Yes, it's hard to follow that because Susan um, really had a lot of substance to her um, considerations. Um, my considerations are more preliminary and, and you know, I'm still open to, to change my, my perspective, but at this current moment, uh, I am not a fan of the MBEs, and I think those should be eliminated from the bar exam. I think our, our bar exam situation should um, essentially uh, be for ABA schools. Uh, they should demonstrate like an 80% pass rate, um, which, uh, which means that it, it needs to be less focused on, on memorization I believe, and instead focus on the ability for the applicant to spot issues and to um, write their analysis in a way that demonstrates their capability of an attorney to analyze those issues. Uh, now, how that's structured, I don't know yet, but um, for graduates from ABA accredited schools, um, I, I do think that an 80% pass rate is, is more appropriate for the CBA schools. Um, or non-accredited schools, maybe we should have a little more stringent standard because um, 
because that of the fact that they're not accredited by the ABA. But um, you know, again, you know, that's debatable. We can talk about that. Um, I do like the uh, performance test portion of the bar exam because you know that that's a real life scenario and students and applicants should be able to demonstrate proficiency in that given their experience as a law school student and presumably getting uh, you know summer jobs with the uh, judges and in law offices they should be able to perform well in that and demonstrate their capabilities but also the other option that we that we discussed today where where you have some type of assignment you're working on the supervision of an attorney and and your work product um, can can demonstrate your ability to practice law we should also factor that into our analysis as well and so those are just my thoughts um, but uh, I, I do believe that the issue with this more or less 30 percent pass rate 30 yeah that's that's a huge problem um, especially for applicants who graduate from ABA accredited schools thank you Ryan is there anyone who would like to volunteer? Natalie? So Susan did uh, have a lot of specific details in, in uh, her comments. So I think what I will just add, um, because I think it complements a lot of what she's already said is from the perspective of um, the law schools. I hope that in our, in keeping an open mind and whether that's an alternative pathway, a bar exam and or both, um, we would create a way of measuring competence that is completely in line with what these new attorneys would be doing in that first year of practice. And thereby, law schools are not in a position of having to make a decision of, will our curriculum be driven by this alternative pathway or this bar examination, or, we're, or will we be uh, training our students to be ready for practice, because um, that really is my biggest criticism of the current uh, form that we use, the bar examination. I don't think it is tied to what new attorneys are doing, and so whatever we come up with, I hope at minimum can fix that, uh, that problem. Thank you. Any other volunteers? Dr. Henderson, you're first on my screen. <laughs> Although you don't have your hand raised, would you like I'm to share with, with your thoughts? I'm fine with going ahead. I have prepared a little uh, thought about it. And so um, the, um, I have, uh, I'm not an attorney and I want everybody to understand I've never been to law school. I'm a psychometrician. Um, and, but I did have the experience of uh, working with the state bar to conduct the practice analysis study that uh, was published a year ago. Um, so um, it, I've, I'm kind of acquainted with some of the issues and, and um, advantages and disadvantages of the various modes of assessment that might be brought to bear on, on the work of the BRC. Um, my first concern is that law schools are not all equal. And uh, as a, a member of the public, looking to the licensure of an attorney, I would want to know that all attorneys have been held up against a common standardized benchmark that uh, so that uh, those people who uh, uh, didn't learn as much and law school uh, would be held accountable for that uh, by earning uh, a lower or perhaps even failing score on the test, while those who learned a sufficient amount, regardless of which school they went to, uh, would, would achieve a passing standard. Um, so that common benchmark, I think, is really important. Um, the alternate, and, and so a, a standardized test would go a long way toward addressing that. And it would also go a long way toward addressing the various psychometric concerns around the content validity of the test the, uh, or, or of the decision to license an attorney, um, as well as all the reliability uh, concerns and uh, the 
determination of the passing standard itself. Uh, those things are all readily addressable in a, in a test that uh, kind of looks and feels a lot like uh, the bar exams that exist today. They're not, it, it's not limited just to a standardized test to be able to satisfy those psychometric concerns. But I do think that the, you know, um, uh, an, so what we've seen in the three or four models uh, of the way attorneys might achieve licensure in other states um, are models that um, rely very heavily on law schools. And if the law schools are uh, not equal in, in their quality, then um, that uh, is a threat, I think, to the um, uh, fairness of the decision making from the public's perspective. Um, also, um, uh, I think that authentic assessments like these programs that we've we've received presentations on um, uh, uh, can be set up to address the psychometric issues. Um, the relationship to practice being fundamental, content validity being fundamental to this, demonstrating that the, uh, the uh, points that are assessed in these programs bears a demonstrable linkage to the, the uh, to a practice analysis study, to to the the critical aspects of practice, and and less affected by the um, uh, idiosyncratic interests of a faculty member or a supervising attorney. Uh, those, those points of variability are, are very big. Um, it, reliability can also be addressed through authentic assessments, but the, the manner in which that has to be done uh, involves an extensive development of scoring rubrics and the, the ways of weighting those to uh, the particular uh, critical aspects of practice that need to be addressed. And then also um, uh, the training of the people who would be involved in doing that scoring um, has to be uh, thought through, <laughs> uh, the training has to happen, and there really ought to be some assessment of the people who complete the training program to do the scoring, to make sure that they are um, uh, aligned to the standard that the state bar uh, as a licensing entity sets for the test. Um, and then also, uh, you know, there needs to be some means of determining what a reasonable passing standard is. Uh, when there's so much variability in, from program to program and from um, uh, mentor to mentor, supervisor to supervisor, then the difficulty of achieving licensure varies dramatically for the individuals coming through the process. We want that difficulty to be the same. It, that is, we want the standard of difficulty to be the same. It won't be equally difficult for the individuals, but, but um, the standard of, of proficiency needs to, um, to be the same for everybody. And the, and the um, challenge uh, needs to be um, established um, in a more in, in really reasonable ways. Finally, um, in a lot of the work that I do as a psychometrician, I position myself on the witness stand, fielding questions from the opposing attorney, and what kinds of challenges they they see in uh, the psychometric 
quality of the examination. We need to be able to position the state bar to address those challenges. And so I, you know, I, I think ultimately I'm, I'm um, in favor of a standardized assessment. That standardized assessment might include performance tests and simulations and, and multiple choice and all kinds of other things. But it might also include some of these um, more authentic approaches that we've heard about. Whatever uh, we end up with needs to be able to stand up to scrutiny on all these points. I know I've talked a lot, so I'll stop now. Uh, but I see a bunch of other hands raised. But, but so thank you, Justice, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. And we have several hands raised up. I'll start with Tracy. Um, well, um, I will make this quick because I am going to just echo what Dr. Henderson said and that I am too for a standardized measure, um, whether it includes some of the alternatives that were presented. Um, I think that there are many, many psychometric properties that really need to be evaluated and that's important as we consider alternatives, they sound wonderful, but they're extremely hard to develop and maintain. So we really need to keep that in mind. Um, and again, working with the various programs that I do at the Department of Consumer Affairs who have tried supervised experience portfolios, apprenticeships, and things like that, I can share a lot of uh, uh, information you know, in the future about the pros and cons and the things that have occurred. Um, but again, I, I'm not an attorney. I just look at this from a psychometrician's perspective. And I would hope that Oregon will go back and do their occupational or practice analysis because they're missing some very foundational information that's going to uh, open themselves up to some pretty serious challenges if they don't get that all linked up uh, to their process. So with that, again, I concur with Dr. Henderson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Neil? So just to offer just a couple of factual bullet points to keep in mind and as part of this whole discussion. So estimates out there show that it takes approximately three to 500 hours to study for a bar exam. Um, probably less if you don't drill down so hard in the memorization skill. Um, the other thing too to consider is that every year, and maybe State Bar staff can correct me if I'm wrong, it's something like 10,000 folks are seeking licensure in this state every year. And the other thing I'll point out too is in the past, as recently as I think three or four years ago, there was an effort to add a pro bono requirement for licensure. And um, that wind up not getting uh, approved because there was a lot of concern about and a lot of, uh, I hate to say this, unwillingness to find, to have supervisors to supervise those folks for, that, for those pro bono hours. Also what we're seeing, and the State Bar folks can chime in on this as well, is that we're seeing in our current provisional licensure program that was created last year, that there seems to be uh, an issue there with folks finding supervisors. And that seems to be an issue even for the folks that were in the expanded program. Um, there's still, more data to be surveyed from that program, which is not over yet. But um, I'm just listing those as, as bullet points to keep in mind. Thank you. Charles. Thank you, Justice. Um, I would couch my commentary and my understanding of my role on this committee, uh, this commission rather, that I occupy a seat that was specifically reserved for someone who has taken and passed the bar and admitted to practice within the last two to three years, uh, that of essentially operationalizing and providing concrete commentary on uh, perspectives that are really pertaining to what it actually is like to practice in the first couple of years of one's career. <laughs> in light of that, I think one of the most salient uh, aspects that has been presented by uh, the different presenters in the last, especially during the last session, was the benefits of uh, maintaining uh, specific California state law emphasis in the curriculum of different uh, classes. Uh, while I am a big believer in the statement that, you know, for example, proves nothing, 
I will say that in this particular situation, uh, anecdotal evidence is valid. In my, uh, in my uh, schooling and practice, it was absolutely uh, beyond beneficial to have, say, an evidence course that was equally split between the federal rules of evidence and the California Evidence Code. Uh, it allowed me to be on a much more firm footing when I entered into uh, working as a certified law student with the uh, Santa Clara County Public Defender's Office, which in turn allowed me to be on firmer footing when I entered private practice a, so slightly over a year ago. With that being said, there was commentary by several presenters uh, at our last meeting that there would be the potential for a knock-on effect if the adoption of, say, a next-generation UBE or even just a de-emphasis of California of a state law-specific curriculum would lead certain schools to de-emphasize that in the curricula of individual courses. Uh, for better or worse, or at the current point in time, bar passage rate is the metric by which law schools are measured. And if there is no longer a California state-specific portion of the uh, in whatever uh, testing and licensure mechanism we uh, choose to uh, recommend, then it would be logical, maybe even necessary to de-emphasize that in the curricula of individual courses. So with that being said, uh, I would just ask and say that I believe it behooves the committee as we break into different subcommittees to uh, maintain an understanding that, that there is a real concrete benefit to maintaining California state specific law on whatever form of licensure that we choose to recommend and that that aspect be considered as the considerations go forward in the subcommittees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeremy. Thank you, Justice. I appreciate it. And uh, all the wonderful comments everybody shared. So I uh, agree with um, everything that Charles just said and mostly with everything that's been said on the call. Um, I guess I just have maybe some questions for uh, all of us to kind of think about and as we sort of move through this process. And I guess I'm just thinking in terms of how the committee assignments are sort of made up, but just some questions that I sort of have is, uh, one is this idea, what options do we already have uh, that allow for non-law school graduates to become attorneys, um, whether that be in-state or out-of-state? What options do we have that allow out-of-state attorneys to become California licensed? Uh, and then do we expand on those? I think the next thing to think about is, I, I like the idea that the California uh, bar exam, uh, that it would complement, uh, the, the pieces of it would complement the other. Meaning that if we offer a PT and essays and multiple choice that they complement the other. So as you study for one, uh, it helps. So as I remember studying for the bar exam, uh, it helped when I would read you know, an essay or a PT and do one of those. And then I would go to an MBE and then um, I would remember something from the essay and then go, oh, well, I remember that answer from this essay or I remember this is how you analyze that. So I think if we're gonna have a California specific MBE, um, I think one thing to think about is does, does that harm um, out of state folks as if they're taking multiple exams um, you know, if they're doing the MBE on one day and then they're doing, you know, a written portion on another day in another state or something, just something to think about. Um, but again, I like the idea that it complements the other. If we're going to have certain aspects of the bar exam, they need to make sense and they need to um, ultimately help the person practice law or at least give them an insight into what the practice of law looks like. Uh, I guess the other few points I would make is that I think that our exam needs to be taught in the law schools, meaning that, you know, the ABA currently requires, um, and Dr. Peterson mentioned this earlier, earlier but that the uh, ABA currently requires that if you want to be ABA approved law school, that you, um, that you basically have to teach certain classes or offer certain courses as a part of the program or curriculum. So does California think about that? Uh, if we're going to change the exam, you know, how are we going to implement that into our schools? Because ultimately we want to have higher bar passage rates, right? And we want California to be a model for the rest of the country. I think the performance test uh, aspect is an important thing, uh, as Ryan uh, Harrison mentioned. Um, but I think that where our state is 70% essentially solo and small firm lawyers, we need to be thinking about offering expanded performance test options not just big law firm memos, uh, because most of us in the state are not working in big law firms. 
And I guess the last piece I would say is, um, and this was mentioned earlier on a couple of comments, which I appreciated. And it is that, does the bar exam help train our law school graduates to practice law? You know, I, I've sort of often said that the most popular law school in the state would be a law school that um, didn't necessarily care about ranking, but cared about, you know, if they, if they could guarantee or somehow guarantee that you could pass the bar exam. And that would mostly be done by teaching to the law, teaching to what's on the exam. Uh, and I would sort of, if we make any changes to the bar, I think that would be um, a number one thing to think about is if we're gonna change the exam, are we then in turn teaching that in the law schools uh, or offering some sort of uh, practical experience to get to that point? And whether we have, the last question I'll sort of think about is, do we have an experiential part and an exam? Um, but I, I, I will definitely say from my personal experience, not speaking for the CLA, um, is this idea that, you know, the bar exam, and I may be the crazy one on the phone call by saying this, but, you know, it's interesting when I studied for the exam, I actually, uh, dare we say, enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it only because it was the one time in my life where I could sit down and focus on one thing and not be focused on a thousand other things. Uh, and going through the exam definitely helped me. Um, I, I could probably say that I learned um, possibly more during that three months of the exam, uh, studying for the exam that I did uh, in three years in law school. And that's only because it was so intense and it was so direct. But again, is that the right way to go about it? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, and I think that this uh, commission will, will answer those questions. So thank you again, Justice. That's all I've got. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I don't see any additional hands raised up, um, but if you, if I call on you and you're not prepared to share your thoughts, then we'll just pass to the next person. Um, so I will start with the order on my screen. Uh, David, do you have any thoughts to share? Uh, make, let me make sure I'm not muted. There we go. Uh, just follow up briefly on the comments that Tracy and Dr. Henderson made about the value of uh, the standardized assessment, especially from the aspect of content validity and defensibility and fairness, and uh, the, the criticality of being able to link the assessment to, uh, to uh, a job analysis. To, uh, to show that there really is content validity. I just want to make sure everybody understands and realizes that the next gen bar examination is going to be based upon a very extensive content analysis conducted in uh, 2019, a job analysis conducted in 2019 that follows one conducted in, I think, 2012. And, and it's very, very similar in its outcome to the California uh, practice analysis that, that Dr. Henderson mentioned. And uh, the next gen will be built upon that and it'll have multiple formats. And that will, uh, as Dr. Henderson emphasized, allow uh, the demonstration of, of content validity, which is, which is critical to uh, a defensible bar exam. So uh, as, as we think about alternatives and defensibility in particular, uh, let's keep a let's keep a sharp eye on the value of the standardized assessment in its new form that uh, will be more modern and will reflect uh, even more than it does so now the uh, actual practice of the first year young lawyer. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Alex. <clears throat> sure. Um, so the debate sort of surrounding the alternative means to the bar exam is not a new one, but the recent low passage rate coupled with the ongoing pandemic really presents us with this opportunity to further explore, you know, whether more permanent opportunities exist to assess minimum professional competency. And the Supreme Court has now offered applicants this opportunity to become licensed through the provisional licensing option but that option is limited in both duration as well as the pool of eligible applicants. 
And so I hope that this solution, however temporary, can now provide a blueprint for us to create a long-term change across this country. The current iteration of this bar exam, in my view, is fundamentally unfair to students who cannot dedicate all their time to studying for the test. And the pandemic really illustrated at a very national level what a lot of us have known for years, right? Which is the bar exam in its current form serves as a barrier to a fulfilling law career rather than a protector of a successful one. Now, consider that we ask law graduates to essentially put their lives on hold for many months while they prepare for the bar. It is truly a tremendous hardship, in my own opinion, for students who need to work or care for the families. And this is what gives rise to the wide disparity, I think, between the passing rates of accredited and non-accredited schools. That said, while I am a proponent of alternative pathways, I remain skeptical that these pathways offer a standardized way for measuring competency. I also remain skeptical that they are abuse proof, which then only makes the issue of equity and fairness worse and not better. So for that reason, I am leaning towards the side of a mixture of a scaled down California specific exam with an extra flavor of the, of the UBE. The California specific part is based on my fundamental belief that California has so many nuances in the law that the applicant must have a firm understanding of the California specific law, something that you just can't get from other jurisdictions. And the scale down part, it's pretty obvious, is to minimize or shift all the weights that are currently given to the bar exam to other parts that are more fair and more equitable. While I do believe, and I think Susan mentioned this earlier, while I do believe that California should continue to be a leader in this area, our decision, as well as a new format of the exam, will have such a dramatic impact, good or bad, positive or negative, on all walks of life and all races that in my view, it is no longer a question of leadership, but one of stability. So if we were to vastly revamp this exam, but nothing that offers us the certainty of stability, in my opinion, we should not consider it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Alex. Josh? Would you like to share any thoughts? I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you, Josh, but although I don't see the mute button on either. Can anyone else hear her? No. Okay, it looks like maybe you're having some technical difficulties. So um, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and move to someone else and then circle back to you. Let's see. How about Esther? Hi, so I agree with Dr. Henderson and also Tracy. I do think that there needs to be some sort of a standardized test. I think here in California, we don't have the benefit of reciprocity and it makes this profession very immobile to a lot of extent. So I think with that being said, I, I think it, it would be beneficial to look into UBE. That way we can examine whether or not, um, how, if our profession can be more mobile, that way we're not just stuck in California necessarily, especially it would be hard to pick up and leave and um, take the bar exam after a certain amount of years without any sort of reciprocity in other states. So I'd be interested in examining the UBE factor. Thank you. Who have I not gotten to? How about Judge Rossi? Thank you, Justice. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I had a lot of feelings about this and then something that, that Charles said a minute ago um, really speaks to me. And that is that 
Um, I guess I want to focus on on the the folks that I'm I'm here to to represent. Um, and as you know, part of the the contingent from COAF, um, I think that. A lot of my feelings about this, uh, about where we move from here, focus really on on the fairness and access issue uh, to law school as a whole, and then to the profession as a whole. Um, like my colleague uh, Ryan Harrison, I'm not a huge fan of the diploma privilege for a number of reasons, uh, and and standardized testing, multiple choice exams, statistically are just not. Um, fair across the board to 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 everyone and, and so i think if we're i think relying on that um as as much as i understand what dr henderson's saying and what tracy's saying and what esther just said about about wanting to have a, a standardized test and because we can validate these things um I, i'm just not sure that 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 moves our profession forward and and provides the access that everyone wants um I, I think that we should move to a more California focused exam. I think it should be performance exam based. Um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Joshua was just speaking about, about or, or not Joshua, but somebody else speaking before, maybe it was Jeremy about their experience on the bar exam and, and the bar exam didn't, um, didn't test for me when I took it 25 years ago, uh, anything that I've done since. Um, and so I think, I think that we need to be more performance focused. And I think, although that makes it harder, perhaps on, on graders and perhaps harder down the line, I think it actually gives us people coming out of law school who are ready to be lawyers. Um, and I do wanna say that uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan of upping the, the clinical practice that happens in law school and getting folks experience uh, when they're law students into the profession, but I'm also really sensitive to what, something that Neil said, and that is that, you know, we we don't have enough supervisors right now for the folks who who want to do that, and that the quality of supervision and the and the experiences that every law school law student gets is not equal across the board either, and um, and so if we're going to focus on on those kinds of routes, then we also have to focus on making sure that. Um, that students of color and, and other disadvantaged law school groups have the same access to the same excellent supervision um, that, that everyone else has. Otherwise, we can't, we can't rely on, on that. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is, is that I, I'm still open uh, to a lot of the options that um, Emily had on her chart, which I wish was still up because it was such a great chart. Um, but I, I, I think that, that we need to, to maybe move away from rote memorization and multiple choice because they just, they, they don't seem to test what we need. Thank you very so. much. Thank you. Justice, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, we can. Thank you, Josh. I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a couple of quick thoughts. Yes. Um, I think the conversation um, is starting to show folks uh, just how complex these issues are. Um, and as I listened, for instance, to uh, Jeremy uh, Evans speak about his experience, and it was not dissimilar to mine, um, one of the things he said that, that, that I heard um, was that it was a time in his life where he was able to focus on nothing but the exam. And um, I can tell you that during COVID and being part of um, the uh, folks that were looking at some of the alternatives during that time, one of the main arguments that was made is there are a lot of people that don't have that ability to just focus on one thing. And so, um, and, and uh, when you don't have that ability and you have a, an exam that is a, sh a short period of time, um, two day, uh, and that's all you're focused on, it's, it, it's hard for folks that have kids, um, folks that don't have a room in their homes that, that they can get privacy at, uh, and so it's very clear to me that, that that's not a solution that um, no matter how you uh, create it, that's not going to have a disparate impact of some kind. Um, the complexity for me is that um, I'm not in favor of total elimination of an exam in, in, in any fashion. I, I, I heard Dr. Henderson and I agree that a um, standardized and scale solution of some sort is going to be important. And I think it's, it's um, upon uh, all of us to always remember that there is a you know, public safety 
is the main reason why we do this. And we need to have some kind of leveling uh, and understanding um, that exists. Um, I also understand it and hear the, the, the comments about being California specific and could not agree more about that. But I also think portability right now is incredibly important, especially with um, demographic changes um, in, in, in the state going, instead of everybody just coming to California, people are going in all directions. Uh, and I think there's a more of a nexus and I think portability is important. Um, and that makes the UBE uh, something that we need to consider. So th to me, those are the questions that we're gonna need to answer. Uh, and I and really appreciate everyone's opinion on it. Um, I think it's been at least helpful for me to hear some of, um, some of the thoughts. I think the, the, the practical side uh, of, of, uh, of the law needs to come out more in the exam and we're gonna have to dig a little deeper into exactly how to get that to happen. Thanks so much, Josh. Yeah. Um, looks like Karen has been able to join us and yes. Yeah, I apologize, I, I'm in the middle of um, my board meetings and so I'm at a lunch <laughs> break, so I apologize. Oh, no problem, it's okay. If you have time. I'm a little have... worried about um, repeating things that others have said. I guess, and, and have you at all discussed whether it's plausible to, to present alternative paths to, to, um, to certification in the sense that for the people who, for whom portability is important, they can elect to take a more universal bar exam for, for lawyers for whom that may not be such a pressing issue, at least at the outset of their careers. You know, perhaps there's something more California focused that's a little less, you know, you know that, that would um, be less portable, but also be more, more tailored or customized to what we want. And I, I agree with everybody I've heard so far that, um, that, the, that, the, that the test as it is seems less apposite and that it's not necessarily testing for what is ultimately going to matter. And, and interestingly, I guess I would put a little more weight on whatever we can do from a sort of a character and, and ethics perspective, you know, that, that, that there's an opportunity there to maybe do something a little more robust um, and, and that there's some trade-off there that, you know, that, that might help pare back what, you know, what is otherwise starting to feel just like a, a speed bump more than, you know, and, and kind of an uneven one. So I, I guess I, I would look at all the levers that we have to get to where we really want to go, which is, you know, what we were just describing as being public safety and kind of creating future lawyers who are who are ethical and capable. But but it, there needs to be a standard. The question is, you know, how do we how do we search for that? Thanks, and and I'll, I, I do like the idea of alternative paths and doing more performance based tests for the people for whom that's a priority. Thank you. Thanks for fitting us in. I know I know that you're super busy, so we appreciate that. We all are. So I'm sorry, sorry, just not to, to have missed the earlier part. That's okay. Um, and who have I missed? I think Leah. Leah, I haven't gotten to you. I don't think. And Donna, I don't know if there's anybody else. If you could just raise your hand, that'd be great. Well, I don't think I'm actually a member of the commission, so I want to be uh, uh, respectful of that. Certainly have have opinions, but I'm not on the commission. Well, you're welcome to share them. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, I think Susan's uh, opening remarks really resonated with me. I tend to uh, think big, and I do feel that California should be a leader. I also think portability is extremely important, but I see those as not um, being inconsistent. Uh, I, I do believe if we build something um, that really does speak to the skill set uh, that new attorneys need to demonstrate, other states will follow and we will eventually have portability based on our model. And so that is sort of um, my view on this. I, I do believe that it's very problematic that the vast majority of attorneys say that the bar exam uh, was not relevant to anything that they did uh, in their practice. And that includes me as well. So I think at, at some point we have to say that the status quo just does not have legitimacy and we have to be open and willing 
uh, to do something different. Thank you. Donna, did you have thoughts that you wanted to share? Um, so I am not going to share because as sort of somebody who's providing staff support to the commission, okay. I really want to maintain that sort of uh, oh, uh, maintain an open mind, but also make sure that you all feel that I have an open mind and I'm able to support you in whatever direction we ultimately move in. I understand. Thank you. And um, Emily and Ryan, you have your hands raised up. So I'll start with Emily. Thanks. I just wanted to add kind of my thoughts in addition to sort of the chart option or the option of chart uh, option that had the charts, chart that had the options. Um, but basically, you know, to me, it comes down to, do we wait for the NCBE or do we create our own exam? Um, I am not a, a proponent of just having an alternative option and getting rid of an exam completely um, for a lot of reasons that have already been articulated. But I would love to find a way if there is to advantage California law school graduates. Um, and if that is, there's a California exam that we could offer in somebody's last semester or earlier than you know, a UBE might be or something that we could work with law schools in conjunction with to, to do that. So that they're, you know, Arizona does this now where they can take the bar after, you know, the before they graduate. So having something that would allow for some better competition for our California lawyers, but then maybe also have some sort of negotiated reciprocity with other states. Um, because I do get the portability, but I'm not sold on the NCBE, kind of like Susan, I have some concerns about that. So anyway, that's, I'm not sure if that's possible, but if we're thinking big and we could think that, yes, you know, we, we want a California specific exam that's like the best in the world. That's what I always try to model. It's like, let's do something. We're going to do it. We'll see what, make it the best in the world. Um, but can we also then negotiate some reciprocity where we would take, you know, I don't know, UBE scores or, or something. I, I want to be fair to everybody, obviously, but I also want to be, you know, concerned about the consumers and the public that are going to use our attorneys in California. I will also say that, you know, I've worked with bar takers for about 17 years and no matter what we do, the law schools are going to be the ones that are going to be be preparing students to pass this exam or to meet the requirements or to find the supervisor that is gonna to have to do the 1500 hours. Law schools will be doing all of that because we have to make sure that our graduates are employed. And if we can't get them past a bar, they aren't employed. We have standards that we have to meet, not just from the ABA, but also from Department of Ed and everything else. So that all of this, when we talk about do we have a new exam? Do we have a new, um, you know, path to licensure or whatever? All of that will be built, eventually built into law schools, no matter the law school, um, because we owe it to our students. We have to get them prepared. We're a professional school. We have to, have to get them prepared to do that. My school at UC Davis, we have 60% students of color and 25% first gen college. Um, and they outperform, I'm not bragging because I have nothing to do with this, but they outperform their, their, their predictors. And, you know, some of that is because we do really emphasize and we have to emphasize that the bar exam, you know, is, forgive me, but it's a game and you've got to play the game right or you're not going to pass. And so I would love, I mean, what Jeremy said really hit me that you know, imagine preparing for a bar exam that actually also helped you be a better lawyer, right? If you're, if you are not studying how to do multiple choice questions anymore, but you're actually studying about how to do a memo or how to talk to a client or how to do those things. And being on the Kappa analysis group, I, I talked a lot with Dr. Henderson and I really agree with him about the ability to find ways to still quantitatively test and to still you know, use all of the evidence-based things that we wanna do, but that is a much more humane test than what we've been working with. So those are my thoughts and thanks for listening. Um, but I really will say this group is amazing. So, so thank you so much for all of your thoughts. Thank you very much. Brian? Thank you, Justice. Um, I, I just recall that when I gave um, my, my thoughts earlier, I did not, discuss the issue of reciprocity. And uh, I think that's a, that's a big issue. And I understand the value of it. 
Um, the problem I have is with just the general statement that some type of UBE could help prepare an, an out of jurisdiction attorney to practice in California. What I, what I think uh, the case should be is something a little more simple, um, which is, you know, an out of jurisdiction attorney should work with a member of the California bar for a year, um, produce some type of written work that can demonstrate their capability to practice in our state. And that um, the member of the California bar should vouch for that attorney to be admitted. And, and I think that would provide maybe a better assessment than someone who could pass a, a multiple choice exam uh, that is more general than specific to California in order to be able to practice here. Thanks. Thank you. Tracy, you had some additional thoughts. I did, if I may. I just wanted to um, just remind the group as I'm listening is that um, an exam doesn't have to be multiple choice. It can be a set of scenario-based questions. Um, and really, a candidate should walk out of an exam going, yeah, I feel like that was fair. I feel like that's what I prepared for. And that's what we always tell our um, item writers when we do our exams at DCA is um, there's a method to writing test questions and ensuring their entry level. And that's why Dr. Henderson and I keep talking about this practice analysis because it's all linked back to that. But really you, you're all correct that the exam, the, the, the students, the candidates should walk out and go, yeah, that, that's what I was, I studied for, that's what I'm expected to do at entry level. And so I, I do agree that whatever is done, again, whether it's an exam or a performance test or something like that, it should be, have, if it has these psychometric qualities, then it should feel uh, valid and legitimate and so forth. And I, I also wanna say for the record that, you know, your, your fail rate is, is very high. It's, it's uncomfortably high. Um, there's no set expected pass rate. Um, we, we don't do that in our field, but we do look at all the prerequisites to take that exam and the more education and training and experience you would expect to have higher pass rates. So I, I, I agree that the pass rate or the fail rate is too high and that needs to be considered. But again, just want to remind everybody that exams aren't just multiple choice and memory. They, they should be um, challenging, but not tricky or unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Henderson? Just a quick follow up, and I uh, want to begin by saying Tracy was spot on with that. Uh, uh, multiple choice is not the only uh, thing to, uh, only item type that is useful in a standardized test. Um, so, you know, stand, uh, multiple choice items do have their place. They, I mean, they're famously criticized because of all kinds of things around testing trivial content and uh, uh, being unfair across culture, things like that. They can be written uh, so that they assess higher order abilities and they can be, uh, they can be demonstrated as fair across uh, different um, background factors. I know that the State Bar has looked at differential performance along several different lines in uh, the uh, function of items on the California specific part of the test. Um, and uh, it's the school rather than the individual that made the biggest difference in those studies. So. I um, want to point that out, but the, the reason that I raised my hand again was just to help try to focus the group on the validity of the licensure decision. The validity of the licensure decision would be that a person who is truly proficient in law passes the test. A person who is truly not proficient in law fails the test. If we have a truly proficient person who fails the test or a truly not proficient person who passes the test, that's error. And error would be something to avoid. <laughs> and there's always gonna be some, but, but it, we want to minimize that error. 
the validity of the pass fail of the pass fail decision, the validity of the score on the test, and the validity of the licensure decision based on the scores, all rely on the evidence that can be pulled together to document that the that the score is a meaningful and accurate assessment of the individual's ability. And so we have to have evidence, regardless of the item type or the testing format or whether it's portable across states or not. We have to have that evidence in order to be fair to examinees and also to prevail in the event that there's a challenge. Thank you. Well, we are at the a little bit beyond the time that we had allocated for this portion of the discussion, but I, I do want to just thank you all for your thoughtful comments and perspectives. I, I'm not I'm going, going to withhold uh, my views at this point, although I will say that I agree it's a complicated uh, analysis and all of you have raised very important issues. I think it's difficult to, to balance wanting to have a, an assessment that is standardized and um, ensures that we're accomplishing our objectives and also making sure that whatever we're recommending is an improvement that is also practical as concrete improvements that can be done and implemented and um, in a way that is fair to everybody. So it's, it's difficult to accomplish that, but I think that today's discussion helps us uh, move along in that process. We do have on the agenda adoption of the guiding principles, and that was circulated to you initially, and we had an opportunity for feedback. So we've made some modifications to that. I don't know if we can put that up on the screen, but I can walk through some of the changes that we've made in response to your feedback. Donna, do you have that? Yeah. Uh, I'm, no, I think I'm sharing. Am I sharing the right document? It looks like yes. Let me just. You're either seeing my notes from today, or you're you're seeing the guiding principles. So. Okay. It looks like this is correct. This is, these are the guiding principles. Thank you, Donna. Okay, great. And we've kept the format um, of it generally the same. Um, you'll see here, um, sorry, let me just pull up my highlights. On the fifth bullet, we've added in under the section about fairness and equity of the exam or exam alternative. We added this additional sentence staying, saying that fairness and equity include, but, not, but are not limited to cost and the mode and method of how the exam or exam alternative is delivered or made available. And that change was made in response to comments that we received previously. Um, we added the paragraph at the end to try to capture a comment about the importance of adding some reference to civility. And also this is designed to convey that um, there are a lot of additional alternatives and characteristics that are important to the uh, setting the foundation for successful practice of law and the protection of the public. This list here is not designed to delineate all of those important characteristics. And also we've added in here that the committee, the commission is committed to promoting the highest standards of integrity, civility and professionalism in the legal profession. And that we will also be guided by these more general objectives as we go along. So we're hopeful that this is something that all of you will approve. And um, at this point, I think if we could put it to a vote with the members who are here. 
I'm happy to discuss any questions that you have also about anything that is not in here. I don't see any hands raised for questions. So, um, oh, Ryan, I'm sorry, Ryan. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, one comment on civility. I mean, it's, it's one thing for us to have civility in our thoughts when we're you know, coming up with our recommendations, but it's another thing for civility to actually be tested in some way on the bar exam. And, and I'm hoping for the latter because as we previously learned in another one of our sessions is that if it's on the bar exam, it's gonna be taught more heavily in law school. And so um, maybe I know we're about to go to a vote, but maybe there's some way to, to put some type of intention in there to have civility actually tested on the bar exam in some way, as opposed to us just making it important to us in our recommendations. Okay, thank you. Are there any other thoughts on that point or others? I think in just in response to that, I understand the the desire to ensure that um, we have some reference to testing for civility in there. I think what we were trying to do is capture the importance of that to our group so that we keep that in mind. I don't think it's possible to outline all of the um, areas or, and I don't think that's the purpose of these guiding principles to do that. I don't think that it diminishes the importance of that because I mean, I, I know in, in my practice as an attorney and now um, seeing young attorneys who appear before me, how important it is to, to us and to the legal profession as a whole. So certainly that is of utmost importance and it's something that I do think that we should keep in mind, but I'm not sure that it makes sense to add it in here as the delineating what should be on the bar exam. At least it, it might, if we had the opportunity to, to flesh it out more, I mean, there may be other things that we would want to add in here also that are also of importance. So without diminishing the importance of it, I'm not sure that this is the appropriate place to put it. I'm happy to hear any additional thoughts though on that or any other issues. And Ryan, did you have any additional thoughts or concerns? No, no additional thoughts or concerns. Um, it's just really important that um, that's covered in some way in the bar exam. Maybe we don't need to put it in this statement, but I'm right. on the back end that, that it is because it's really important. And what I'm experiencing is a lot of incivility coming from opposing counsel daily. And I, I agree with you on that. Okay. That's the importance of that. Thank you for your comments. Okay, um, I'm not sure if there's a, a voting mechanism that we can use for this, Donna. Uh, Kim can call the roll. Okay. Yes. Ms. Pachian? Yes or no? Oh, I'm yes. sorry, we should have, a, we should have a, a motion to adopt the mission statement and a second on that motion. I'll move it. So moved. Second. Second. Seconded. Sorry, who's second? Alex. I'll second. So motion made by Mr. Harrison and second by Mr. Chen. I'm gonna take roll call now. Ms. Bastian? Yes. Mr. Boyd? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Evans? Ms. Gardina? Mr. Harrison? Yes. Dr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Lynn? Yes. Ms. Montes? Yes. Mr. Pertula? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Judge Rossi? Yes. Ms. Gavillero? Yes. Ms. Silverman? Yes. Ms. Williams? Approved. 
the motion passes justice thank you very much thank you everybody um jeremy you have your hand raised yes sorry uh i was switching computers i vote yes too <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> thank you thanks Okay, and um, next on the agenda uh, is a discussion of next steps, which is what we've been doing here today, uh, discussing how to proceed. We did have an uh, initial um, discussion before at the end of our last meeting about the possibility of splitting up into um, different subgroups to explore more in depth the various alternatives, one group to explore in more depth the uh, bar exam a bar exam component and the other to explore uh, further alternatives to a licensure exam examination i had indicated that i would uh, um, request that you let me know your preferences um, but i see donna has her hand raised up and i'm not sure if there are alternatives also that anyone would like to propose for the next steps we do have already on calendar, the next scheduled meeting, which is in November, I believe, first of November, but I may be wrong. On the date. November 4th. Oh, November 4th, okay, thank you. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on um, whether to proceed in a different manner or any questions about the proposed approach? Donna? Yeah, so I think we have an interesting opportunity having uh, heard the thoughts of folks to figure out, are there any themes from uh, where we're heading that would shape whether the two working groups that we originally envisioned are the right topics for the working groups? Um, or should there be, should, should we modify those topics a little bit? So just sort of, right, getting a, a feel for, for where people um, came down. And I, I, I have to admit, I had to step out for just a few minutes um, to deal with the refrigerator repair man. But um, so I missed, uh, I missed, I think the end of Charles's comments and I missed some of Alex's comments. But from what I was hearing from uh, folks, um, it seems like, um, you know, sort of thinking about the types of things that, that we heard some potential interest in moving on. Um, there was interest in a California specific exam. There was interest in um, in uh, there was interest in a in no exam. There was interest. Um, there was interest in. It, it seemed to me, and this is where right everyone else needs to tell me. But it seemed to me like the interest in the UBE in the UBE was based on an interest in portability um, or reciprocity. Um, and um, and not so much about we should go with the UBE for substantive reasons. Um, and so you know it may be that that exploring those kinds of options, a California exam, alternatives that do not include an exam, um, and um, and building into each of each of those two subjects, and how would portability work with that or reciprocity work with that, as opposed to spending time further exploring the, the UBE if that's not the will of the of, of the group. So just trying to sort of summarize the directions that I was, I was pull the threads that I was pulling out from the comments. Thank you. Are there any other thoughts on that? I think that. Um, the, the UBE component of it, I don't think it's completely off the table, but I, I view that as being part of the, still more uh, part of the A bar component and, and then separately the no exam or alternatives to the exam. But it seems like these are issues that can be further fleshed out in the subgroups um, as we go along. But also we can develop before the next meeting, I think um, just more concrete parameters for each of the subgroups that will assist in the discussion. I mean, I don't think that we have to do that now, but I do think it's, it, I agree with you, Donna, that it's helpful to sort of reflect on the comments that we've received from the group so far 
and then um, that will help frame our discussions in the two subgroups. But we can have additional items that um, will be prepared in writing in advance for those discussions for the breakout groups. Um, any other comments at this point? So uh, at this point, um, I will go ahead and I, I would ask you just to expect some communication from us about the, the next meeting and um, we'll develop these additional you know, parameters and potential discussion topics. Um, to more to better focus the discussion of each of the subgroups and then ask for your interest as we develop the subgroups. Again, keeping in mind that we're going to try to uh, make the assignments in a way that makes sure that we have different perspectives in the, in the two subgroups. Okay, Justice, thanks. can I ask one more question? Sorry. Yes. No, uh, it's okay. Uh, I cannot remember who raised it. I think it might have been Jeremy or Ryan, but um, the question about the the fact that we right now California does have an ability to work with a lawyer and work with a judge to to get a path to licensure rather than the law school, and there's also the ability for like Pro Hoc Vice or whatever it is for for other folks to come out of state and practice for a little bit or you know, the attorney examination, things like that. I just think if, if there's information that could just be emailed to us about what that is, and, and maybe that should be part of the conversation when we're thinking about alternatives, um, just so that we're aware of what already exists and maybe the, like one of those programs could be modified. So that was just my thought. If, if when you're sending information, if that could be included, okay, uh, that'd be great. Okay, so just in advance, like we have been putting information in the library, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that would be okay. great. Any other um, requests for additional information from the group? Yeah, I don't see any hands. So at this point, I'm going to conclude the meeting business portion and ask if anyone else has any additional business for the group. So just, clear, just to clarify, Justice Guerrero, so is the plan that, um, that the November 4 meeting it, it is, is a meeting of the subgroups or? Um, it, is that going to disrupt the schedule? Is it possible to do that? It's just going to reverse the schedule. We had folks reserve, da reserve dates at, uh, every month. One was going to be subgroup. One was going to be full group. It'll just, it'll start us on a, uh, it'll switch it for the next couple of meetings anyway. If not, it, I don't know how, we don't know how long each of the subgroups will go on. So, but certainly for the next couple of meetings, it'll swap. And so the subcommittee would be November. The full group would be December. Okay. Yeah, I think that will be necessary um, if the objective is then to meet and then we can discuss at the, what, or we can communicate in email. If we're meeting in subgroups, Josh and I will both be present for each of the subgroups and then we can assess the what the format of the next meeting will be. So I would just ask you all to just keep those dates on your calendars. Is that okay from your perspective, Donna, logistically? Yes. Okay, thank you again, everybody, for your thoughts here today. And I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Justice. Thank you.